Okay, hi everybody. In this short video, we're going to talk for just a little bit about how to do uh, basic MPI programming using MPI send and receive. Uh, send and receive are our basic point-to-point -point blocking communication functions that MPI provides us. Uh, now, these two functions are relatively simple. Point-to-point -point communication is a little bit how you imagine it to be. Uh, one worker, one rank, uh, wants to send data, another wants to receive that data, and, uh, well, you call send on one node, you call receive on the other, and you wait, you block, when the other node is not ready for your communication until they are ready for your communication, uh, and then you do the handoff. And so these are important because these are really the fundamental utilities that MPI and really all networking code is based on. Uh, we're going to talk in the future about more advanced MPI functions that let us do more advanced operations in a single function call. But all of them are built on MPI send and receive. We will have communications that communicate to 10 different nodes and do a specific operation for each node. But again, it's just send and receive under the hood. Uh, and so that's really the key detail to keep in mind here. And so I think we can just go ahead and dive right on in uh, and take a look at how it works. So uh, we went ahead and I set up this template. We actually started this in class. Uh, but we're going to fill it out, and the goal here is to sketch out a program that will send data to another node and display that data. And so we went ahead and set up MPI init, we went ahead and set up MPI finalize, and we've got some variables here. Uh, let's go ahead and fill out our MPI rank and our MPI size. We probably won't actually need the size, but we'll make use of it. So we'll flip to our documentation here so you can read along as I do this. We're going to call MPI com rank. Uh, we're going to give it a communicator. Recall that communicator, the communicator we've talked about so far, is the MPI com world communicator. Uh, and we're going to give it the address of our rank variable. Rank is an output parameter. You give it the address, it fills in some data whenever the function call returns. Uh, likewise, let's do MPI com size, which works very similarly. You give it a communicator that you're interested in getting data from uh, and an output parameter size, and it will tell you what the size is. So we can go ahead and write up a print, printf statement uh, just to verify this works. So we'll just say uh, this hello from rank blah um, of, you know, out of however many we have. So we'll say we'll print rank and then we'll print size and we'll get something like this is rank 15 out of 30. Uh, or in our case, maybe much less. Uh, so that's enough for now. Let's go ahead and build this and see if it works. Now I ran make. Uh, if you had your own code that you've been working on and you ran make, you might have run into an error right here if you forgot to do module load MP open MPI. And so you want to make sure you've done that. I had already done it. If you're not sure, you can check module list uh, and it will show you what you have loaded. And you can see I have open op MPI 4.0.3 loaded. So that built our application. Now we could run it like we usually run programs, but that's just going to tell us uh, not much. MPI is not going to work correctly uh, when we do it this way, because we need a node allocation. We need to, to request more than one node, and we haven't asked for it. And really, this isn't the way to run MPI programs to begin with. You need some sort of MPI exec or other helper command. In our case, we want srun. Now, I'm already on an allocation, but let's hop off of it for the sake of argument. 
Um, I want to allocate some sort of resources. Let's go ahead and search my history, my command history, for when I've used salloc in the past. History gives you the list of all of your, like your last 1500 commands. Grep searches input data for a string match. And so you'll see I've matched all these red salloc's. This last one looks great. We can allocate two nodes for an hour and that should get us through this video, I sure hope. So you watch me do exclamation point 1017 saying, please execute the command that was the 1017th command I executed in my history. Uh, and so we'll wait for our allocation and then we're able to hop in and start using srun. Now, when we do this, most likely we're gonna get an error. Uh, it's gonna be pretty scary. It's gonna say stuff about Opal and ext3 and slurm and pmix and MPI errors and really just a bunch of bad things that you're actually not expected to understand. Um, we made a very simple mistake but an easy mistake to make uh, and this just varies based on computing systems. Some cloud and supercomputers have this problem and some don't. Um, if we hop over to our Centaurus user notes, which we've talked about and are linked on Canvas. If we come down here to see how they run MPI jobs, you'll notice that when they run srun, they have an argument in between this MPI pmix, which is really this pmix that we're talking about here. So if we just paste this in between our srun and our main, hopefully it will work for us. And you'll see we get a much better response. We got hello from rank one out of two. We got hello from rank zero out of two. That's what we expected to get. So let's go ahead and jump back in to main. So now we want to talk about how MPI programs really work. Remember, your MPI program, the same binary executable is going to execute on every node. That means we need to write our code with the understanding that there needs to be logic in here that allows nodes to take different paths. Let's say, for example, you wanted to set up a client server based communication mechanism. You've got a bunch of clients, you've got one server that needs to receive data from all of these nodes. Uh, that means that for MPI, we need to have logic in here that determines are we the client or are we the server? And then the actual logic for what the client and the server are supposed to do. Uh, it turns out a lot of network-based applications are actually written this way. You have a single executable for both the client and the server. Uh, and then the arguments and the input data determine what role they actually take. Now, that's not true for enormous scale things, but uh, you do see this from time to time for basic applications that do client server model or other sorts of network activity. Uh, so with that in mind, we really, the best determiner, determinator, that we're discriminator that we have for what job should we do, what task should we do, is going to be our rank. And so, we're gonna make decisions based on our rank. Now I'll go ahead and make this somewhat safe. Um, the best way to do this is probably to write something like uh, if rank, uh, if rank will work, and actually we can leave this alone, uh, true if, zero, if not zero, false if zero. The thing to consider if you do it this way, and I'll go ahead and leave it like this for the sake of time, but uh, the thing to keep in mind is that means that if we write our code expecting only rank zero and rank one, uh, but then we use this logic, we're gonna find that, um, you know, this code actually works for arbitrary number of nodes. Every node that isn't rank zero takes this if path. So you have to be careful, you might have unintended side effects if you run with a strange number of nodes you didn't intend to. But we'll leave it alone for now. We're not gonna mess with all those details here. 
let's go ahead and assign values to x. So let's go ahead and make up a number, I don't know, 347. Uh, and let's actually assign that in the zero case. Uh, in the case your rank is one, let's just go ahead and assign the value to be zero. Or even better, let's make it negative one. Because really that, that's a placeholder value, we don't want to use that. Now let's go ahead and print this out and see how well this works. Uh, so we'll say value of x on rank blank is blank. And then we can go ahead and fill in rank and x. And let's run our code again to see what we get. We expect to get two different numbers. We hope we get two different numbers. So let's S run it. And what you find is the value of x on rank one is negative one, and the value of x on rank zero is 347. And again, these are running on totally different computers, but using very basic logic, we've determined that they will have different outcomes. Uh, okay. So now we want to use that same logic to decide who sends and who receives. And in this case, let's go ahead and make the rank zero the sender and rank one the receiver. And so we're going to pass the value of x around. Let's go ahead and do MPI send. Let's hop over to our MPI send documentation. So MPI send expects a buffer, which is usually an array, but in this case we'll just give it the address of x, which is an array of one, because there really is no distinction between a regular integer and an array. Um, pointers are arrays, even if the size is one. So int count, uh, we've got one element. Now our MPI data type, we can hop over here I think the best place to look is actually the mpitch documentation. mpitch is a different implementation of MPI. It's actually a, usually a more efficient version of MPI than OpenMPI. For whatever reason, OpenMPI open does not have great um, documentation on the MPI data types. And to some extent, some of these are in the specification, some are not. Uh, but most of these are compatible between MPI and, uh, or between OpenMPI and MPitch, and so we can use them. And you'll notice the name convention is pretty simple. For most types that you have, it is all, all uppercase, MPI underscore whatever type you're used to using. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and paste MPI int in here. Why not? Now let's hop back over to MPI send. Now our destination, we want to be a little bit careful about. We are rank zero. We want to send our data to rank one. And so we will put in the value one uh, to determine where it's going to be sent to. And we need a tag. Let's use the tag uh, one, two, three, four, because why not? Again, the tag is like the subject of an email. We just need to make sure it matches when we expect it to match. And I'll show you an example of that here in a minute. Uh, and the communicator will give the MPI com world, as always, at least for now. Uh, there is good, there are good uses for other communicators, um, but they are usually for more advanced things. It's when you have lots of nodes and you need to juggle multiple streams of things going on. Uh, now you'll notice I've just copied MPI send and moved it up here. Uh, that will kind of work, but not exactly. Uh, let's go ahead and write this from scratch and we'll see what kind of mistakes we could have made if we had done that copy and paste. So I'll call it MPI receive and let's check the MPI receive documentation. MPI receive also requires a buffer. In this case, this is where the data is going to go. In the case of MPI send, it's where the data is coming from. In both cases, for us, we're going to put it in x. We could have declared a different integer x, or y, or z, or, or whatever you want the, the name to be. It doesn't matter. Um, you just want it to be wherever the data is supposed to be stored. And it needs to be large enough to hold that data. And so the count is 1. x has a size of 1. 
the data type is still MPI int. The source is zero. We're expecting a message from rank zero. The source is not one. If you're not careful with your copy and paste, you'll do this. Uh, if you get the ranks mismatched, you will deadlock. You will block for a communication that is never going to come if you mess up the ranks or the tags. So you need to be a little bit careful whenever you do this. All right, and then we need our tag to match, and we still want to use MPI com world. And in this case, I don't care very much about the status. Sometimes there's good uses for status. It tells you where node, where uh, messages came from, what rank they came from, what tag they were. That's more useful if you use wildcards and other sorts of um, other sorts of um, methods, more advanced methods, we may use the status, but not for what we're doing here. Uh, now, the one thing I will say is that um, we're being a little bit loose with error values. You'll notice the return value here. When you write code, you probably want to catch that return value. If your communication fails for some reason, you probably want to know why. Um, but we won't do that for the sake of this, just to get you through the video. All right, so we've got um, our two commands here, or our two function calls here. You notice that basically they're identical, except the ranks are flipped and receive requires this null tag. So once we've done this, why don't we go ahead and print back out the value of everything. We'll make sure it's the post value and give this a shot. So we'll go ahead and run make. Uh, and then I will go ahead and again, you almost caught me do it. I almost ran the program again, but that's not what we want to do. We need to run s run. Uh, and you'll see here I'm using exclamation point s run saying, please look at my history and find the most recent command starting with s run, uh, which happens to be this one up here. And actually, you might have caught me do that here too, but it's taking this and pasting it here when I do this exclamation point s run. Uh, now we get a lot more output. Hello from rank one. Rank one starts at negative one. Now, the post value of x on rank one is 347. Likewise, on rank zero, we started with 347 and we didn't change the value. This means it worked. No longer is x negative one. We were able to send the value 347 from rank zero to rank one and override its value. That's great, that's how MPI send and receive are supposed to work. Uh, you know, a couple of things you'll notice here, the output is not in any order. These two messages should have been printed before send completed, uh, and they were, but that's not exactly how the order of these asynchronous operations takes place. These are going to show up in whatever order they are communicated back to my terminal um, from whatever node they run on. So this is a complex SRUN mechanism to even make the output appear. The output is not guaranteed to be in order, at least not in the order that it took place. Um, generally within a, the same program, in the same process on the same computer, output will come out in the same order to the same, you know, if you're sending the standard out, that will tend to stay in order if it's from the same thread process, node, et cetera. But you don't get any guarantees once you do things in parallel, so keep that in mind. Uh, and that's the majority of this. I mean, once you can send and receive data back, you can make this arbitrarily difficult. You can, um, communicate however much data you want. You could send more than one message here. Um, if, you want, if you had data larger than X, you could uh, set up a communication scheme. You could send data back and forth. Rank one can become the sender and rank zero can become the receiver. Um, 
that's really the key here is that um, once you're able to do this much, the rest of it is up to your creativity uh, and your problem specifications. So this kind of gives you, this video gives you the tools to do what you need. This, I think it's a simple walkthrough, but uh, well, I don't think it's a, a simple, or it's a simple, it's a simple concept. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it is simple. Uh, so now, uh, it's up to you. So you've got an assignment that you can work on uh, that asks you to do basic things like this. And then we'll try something more interesting as we move along. Anyway, if you watched this far, thanks for watching. Remember to check out these documentation pages. You can just Google MPI com size open MPI and you'll get the documentation page. Don't forget about Centaurus user notes. Um, you know, you've got man pages. This is the online version, but you do have manual pages for MPI. Uh, and the types here. And of course, you can send any, you know, there's a way to communicate anything you want. If you really want to send strings instead, of course, you can send strings. Why not? Anyway, that's enough for this video. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in class.